Welcome to Build. I'm Simon Atkins. As always, we are live from London. Now, today I'm joined by an actor, an American actor who's graced our screens over the last four decades in films such as Sleepless in Seattle, While You Were Sleeping, and Independence Day, to name just a few. Starring in All My Sons at the Ulvik, please welcome Bill Pullman. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Lots of love in studio of you today, Bill. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Now, before we get into it, if you guys at home want to get involved and ask Bill a question, you absolutely can. You can tweet us at Bill Series LDN or leave a comment below this video if you're watching live on Facebook. Welcome. Thank you very much. So you are starring in All My Sons at the Old Vic, um, which I saw on Saturday night, and I must say it was absolutely phenomenal. I was blown away, so congratulations. It was really, really brilliant. And um, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But first, um, how, how is your time in London? I'm having a blast. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Are you living here? I'm living, yeah. I, I uh, asked for a flat that's within walking distance of the theatre, so I'm in Lambeth. Nice. Yes, right near the Imperial War Museum. So what are you doing? You're, I mean, you're basically a tourist. Are you, are, you, are you spending your time walking around the city, or are you too tired after doing like nine, ten performances a week? Well, I'm looking forward to being a little bit of a tourist or something, but uh, we've been working so hard because we just had our press night this last week so it was a hard push you know, phenomenal to to reviews this place. it's had you know uh the old vic is a great old gal 200 years old and it's a great honor to be uh playing there because i first went there in 1973 when i was wow. a college student i saw productions there that the the um, um royal shakespeare company had it for a few years then and uh to be able to play there and know the heritage of it all is a great, great honor, and I can walk to work. Which is, which is a dream when you live in London, because nobody wants to get the tube, do we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is your uh, UK stage debut. Um, have you always wanted to, to, to um, perform at the West End? Well, I think because of that experience, you know, I came in 1973, and London was kind of a gritty city, as was New York City. It, the 70s was kind of the trial for everybody, and uh, just walking along the Thames was nearly impossible. And, uh, you know, I've watched it from in that, those days. I lived in Finsbury Park for, this was, uh, I was a student, so I was right, here okay. for a semester. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a great, very formative time, so to be able to come and be on stage, I've tried to do it a couple of times before. It's tricky, you know, to hold a spot when you, uh, a lot of things are moving and shifting with movies and TV, but I really, I, you know, committed to this last year and just stuck to it because I really wanted to do it. Um, so it's on until the 8th of June, and you're doing, how many performances do you do a week? Are you doing eight or nine? Eight, yeah, we okay. do eight, yeah. Um, and obviously, when I was there on Saturday night, um, there was a standing ovation for you and Sally Field at the at the end. It, it, it's an unbelievable play. It's probably one of the best plays I've ever seen. It's written by Arthur Miller, who also wrote Death of a Salesman and uh, The Crucible. Can you tell people a little bit about what it's about? Uh, uh, Arthur Miller was... So, uh one, his second play, I think, and it was 1947, right after the World War II, and uh, he was, you know, I think he f it follows a family who uh, has had some tough knocks because of the war. Uh, two sons, one of them uh, turns up missing from the war, and the other returns successfully. And uh, there has been uh, allegations brought against my character uh, that he get, has been exonerated, though, and uh, seems to be living the American dream until a figure comes from the past and uh, it gets disrupted. So, as you said, um, it does look like on the surface, Joe and the whole family are living the American dream, but he is very much a troubled man in kind of s difficult situation. What was it like bringing that character um, to life? And was there any difficulties that you faced? Well, you know, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, look, uh, looking at that, I don't even recognize myself. I see my father. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Is it, well, yeah. You know, I think there's a history of this play with the, the character of Joe being played by 
kind of a stocky guy. Uh, Ed Begula Jr. was the stock, uh, was one of the ones that do it. Or kind of a real workman, uh, working class guy. And I've th done lots of different kinds of parts, but I didn't know if I've how that would feel. But uh, the language of the play is so rich, and uh, I think for the whole ensemble, and. Uh, I think uh, I, that was a, a great thing to walk into the when we first read through the play. You know, I'm arriving in England, and I had just come from working on something else, and though I'd been prepping for the play, but uh, I suddenly get to the room, and I'm talking with all these people that have British accents, and I go, "Oh, <laughs> was I going to have to do this with an English accent?" <laughs> and then they started in reading, and I was so impressed by this company of actors. They're unbelievable and how you know it feels like we're in ohio 1947 um and what surprised me as well is that it's all played out in one set on one set and the sets don't change but it just captivates you from start to finish that you don't even care about about that um, and speaking of incredible actors you star alongside two-time academy award winner sally fields who plays um, your wife, who is unbelievable as well in this play. What was it like? What is it like working with her? Oh, uh, she's, uh, yeah, just thinking about how long she's been working, you know, from a teenager doing Gidget and Flying Nun TV series that were there, and then just each generation, you know, she, each decade, she manages mm. to find really important work to do. And as a person, she's... Um, Really, it has a lot of integrity, a lot of discipline, and I think it's been really important to the spirit of the of the group. You know, she plays your wife, uh, Kate Keller, in a beautifully pitched performance with absolute wrung out intensity, doesn't she? As she tries to keep um, your son alive, who 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 died uh, by by sheer force of will. What is it like developing um, and collaborating on those characters with Sally on stage? Yeah, the, you know, I think it's important. We have uh, Jenna Coleman is playing yes. uh, the uh, daughter-in-law kind of character, and the, um, uh, Colin Morgan's playing uh, this, our son Chris. And the four of us is is kind of uh, is important to have this uh, connection and also. A sense of walking on eggshells when you're uh, mm. some of we know when you're in a difficult family domestic situation with one person that is unpredictable, uh, how everyone else adapts around it, and I think um, the the success uh, of uh, that I feel best about is the fact that we've all managed to have such a lot of information just passed with one glance. You know about don't talk about that. You know in a glance, and we better not go there. In a glance, and that's shared by all these uh, these actors. Amazing actors. I feel lucky that way. Um, Miller does say um, um, that Joe is slightly uneducated and has a lot to learn about the world. Your your character, Joe. Um, do you think this this goes um, in a way to excuse his past? Um, you know what he's done in the past. I I think. Uh, yeah, there's a lot about what uh, buried trauma is, you know, in which you're in denial. You know, it's, uh, what is it they say, that it's not just a river in Egypt? Denial? <laughs> I would thought maybe I could get a little awake response, but it's true. It's a... Uh, and I, it's very interesting, you know, because I'm in the middle of doing this TV. I haven't done a lot of TV as much as all these other people there have done. But um, I'm doing The Sinner, and it'll be the third season. We start in the fall. And the, the showrunner said, what, you know, I think there's a reason why you're doing All My Sons, because you'll learn something that you'll apply to season three of, all, of Sinner. Interesting. Which I thought was very curious. Yeah. Interesting. So, so season three is definitely happening of the Sinner. 
Um, is there anything that you can tell us about it, or what do you know about it? Not or, or, or not a lot. Well, it, you know, they they're st in the writers' room is going on now, and uh, oh, I gotta get rid of this get, get pillow. Oh, well. <laughs> I started to feel like Better. I'm going this way, <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, they're writing it now, and. Um, I do know that uh, the actor Matt Bomer right. has been attached, and he, his character is uh, helps to take Ambrose on. Uh, I'm the recurring character on this as a police detective in a small town in upstate New York, and um, the first two seasons largely dealt with me encountering people who have buried traumas and kind of evolving that. And this one, kind of, I'm told through Matt's character, mm. gets to another level. Okay. Uh, with not just him, but a larger network. Of and denial. then how soon before filming do you normally get the scripts? You know, we have had uh, usually the week before. <laughs> okay. So for season one, it was kind of based on the book, wasn't it? But then season two, I suppose, are you getting so are you getting the, the scripts on a weekly basis and you're just trying to... We have so far, but this okay. year, uh, largely because uh, we got a little more time. I, we have shot it in the summer before, and so we've started with maybe two scripts. And uh, and then this, the scripts come along as we're, as we're working it. I kind of know an arc of sorts, but you don't really know what's going on. And so, uh, but this time they're hoping that they'll have all eight episodes by July, I guess, and okay. they'll start shooting in September. Okay, here's hoping. Yeah. Um, so this is the first time that you've played a role um, in a series that has had multiple seasons. How did the, the role of um, The Sinner come about? And what were your first thoughts when you read the script? Yeah, I uh, I uh, remember thinking uh, that it was a, about a guy in western New York State, uh, upstate New York, who uh, was very interested in botany, and uh, all these things are true to my life. And I thought, what are they? Uh, they're trying to back me into a corner here, with, uh, <laughs> naming all of me, all sides of me, and. Uh, and I think it's the nature of this uh, very good opportunity we have to work with this guy, Derek Simon, who is a very talented writer. And he's very uh, kind of Jungian uh, in his, somewhat in his okay. background. So he enjoys knowing that if we can bring things from our own lives into the story, that we have more authority about what we're talking about. Well, that, that was my next question. I was going to ask you because, you, you know, you play um, Detective Amrose, who has a lot of past trauma. How much of your own life experience do you bring to a role like that? Well, definitely season two was quite uh, a bit of like a shadow. It walked really? right along with me and it was the darker side of my, because it follows uh, Ambrose going back to his hometown um, and he, in order to kind of begin to solve this problem that said developed there, he has to kind of encounter what happened to him when he was young. And um, a lot of that was taken from my own life. Uh, you know, as it was, we began to build the character in this first season. Derek remembered it all. <laughs> Darn him. These writers, they don't let anything go. No, they don't. Um, well, we can't wait to see what's in store for um, for season three. Let's talk about some of your earlier roles, um, like when you played President Whitmore in Independence Day. Do we remember that? Yeah. Who had yeah. You yeah. Oh, that <laughs> an, an awesome movie. Do you still get asked to do that speech? Oh yeah, it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's so it's amazing how. Uh, but I love to see the parodies of it, you know, and I if often encourage, <laughs> any, if anyone says, I know the speech, you know, I'll, I love to hear them give a rendition, you know, and, or people send me links to people uh, doing the speech at weddings or really? at, at football games or things like that. So it seems to live on. Yeah, well, it was, it was, you were awesome in it and it was an amazing um, movie. And you actually watched that movie with the president at the time, Bill Clinton. Yes. How did yeah. that come about? That was a, 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 you know, there was an interest he had that in the showing movies at the White House, and they have a theater down there with, I think it was 50, 
52 seats in it for, kind of for each state and the territories. <laughs> so uh, it was, it, all of a sudden we were in the middle of press in New York and there, we're told we're gonna fly there and, and watch it. And there was a seat next to the president and uh, he, as we, I'm standing in the back and he uh, said, there's a seat down here. Hey, you, one of the filmmakers come down here and the director was, is German, uh, Roland Emmerich. Oh, I am German, I can't go down there. <laughs> and I can sit next to the press. So I went down and it was very good. He's, he's, he's a good orator himself, you know. And uh, I think um, uh, it was great to have Hillary lean in as it ended and go, well, if we ever need to take a weekend off, we know we can get you. <laughs> be do it good to get you. But, uh, you know, and I went to the Churchill War Rooms. I did get a little bit of time, you know, to walk around a little bit. And that's a brilliant uh, encounter with a great speech maker. I was, you know, they, uh, Churchill's words were so precise. And yeah. we did borrow a bit, you know, yeah, yeah, from yeah. on the beaches. And okay. on the, you know, I mean, the cadences and things, uh, you know, that's a good model if you want to make a point. Did he? It must be quite weird uh, watching your president's speech with the president who is obviously amazing at giving speeches yeah yeah it, uh, i just thought um yeah this is all wrong i should <laughs> 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 farthest thing from but he was very generous and then you know I, it was also i went back to the white house when obama was president because okay. i did 1600 pen which was a short TV series, that, uh, it, but uh, about the White House comedy about it, and uh, hit the one of the writers was his staff writer, and uh, so they brought us all down there for that, and uh, so we I watched myself again, <laughs> being president with the president. I mean, that's it's a, an amazing experience to to be invited to the White House twice. Yeah. Um, so let's take it back to the beginning of your career because you originally started out in theatre. So you, um, you know, that was your that was your your medium, wasn't it? But you were quite a late bloomer, and you only started at what age? You know, I think uh, first movie was eight, uh, eighty five, so I was thirty two. Thirty two. Yeah. So what did you do before that, and why did you decide to move into to acting? Uh, yeah, I, I always took a long road around, you know. <laughs> I always re I did a play by Edward Albee, who is a great writer, American writer, you know, and he said, sometimes you have to go a long way out of your way in order to go a short distance correctly. And I like that idea, you know, it's like I, something in me knew that I, I just needed to follow my interests, and I started out at a vocational college for building construction, and then... There was a guy who was putting on plays there, not even a professor, but he was doing Eugene Ionesco's uh, The Bald Soprano. Okay. And that's an obscure play, even for British people who <laughs> see a lot of plays. And uh, it, But I was infected by it. I thought it was brilliant. And uh, so he said, you got to do what I did, go to this college and then go teach someplace. And I did that. I was teaching in Montana and directing plays and I um, had been really influenced by my time in London where I got to see municipal theater companies making plays about local stories and you know we really didn't have a lot of that in America at the time so I thought this is a good life I'll be in Montana we'll be making stories about Montana and putting them on stage and but uh, there was something in me, that, like an itch that hadn't been scratched. So okay. that's when I moved to New York. And so, and so when you acted in your first play, did you kind of just know straight after that there was no going back and this is what you wanted to do? Yeah. it's a, I think um, a lot of people come to it for different reasons. Uh, you know, I just realized how somewhat awkward and shy I was. Um, it wasn't easy for me to, and the, to be able to rehearse what you're saying seemed like a good gift yeah. and a necessary thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you get to feel like you're living vividly on stage in a way you don't necessarily really get to live inside very long when you're doing a movie or television because those takes last for a certain period and then you got a big break while they change cameras and angles and... 
Whereas once the play starts, you live yeah, and this you're in thing. that moment. Yeah, and things are happening, and each night it's different, and there's things you're aware of that you hadn't been aware of that you're taking in and including, and you're a little bit of the editor as well as the director, you know, because you can turn your head, and when you turn out, you know, that's a, you're, it's like making a cut or something sometimes. Uh, not that I'm always that conscious of it, but. Uh, I think the power of it, I'm always remembering great performers. Um, um, Nicole Williamson, I saw yeah. when I was here in the 80s, and you know, I've seen such good, uh, and um, Jason Robards and Colleen Dewhurst that I saw in New York when I was in the 70s, and those kind of strong performances that I uh, realized that they were such human people up there and what they were experiencing felt like I got to a nuance of what it is to be human that I got from nowhere else, not from a novel or not from a film as much, but sitting with the audience and witnessing this thing was the strongest thing that I wanted to be part of. Well, you're you're incredible at what you do, and um, we we love watching you on screen and on stage. Um, before we go, I do need to ask you about your new docu series, Epic Yellowstone. What can you tell us about that? Well, I uh, I love that uh, you know it's uh, it's on uh, here in England on the Smithsonian Channel, but um, I. When I got out of, when I was first, I went to do Shakespeare in Montana. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> you can't believe, you know, the, uh, I, I think it's uh, <laughs> one of the great training grounds is to play outdoors with dogs and everything else going, planes and no mics. And we're, we would tour from town to town in Montana. And then I ended up... Uh, uh, teaching that what was the question all of a sudden i started to dream about montana and i sorry simon hit Ep me again what, epic what? yellowstone epic yellowstone oh series. my god <laughs> i just went deep and like this uh it's partly because i got invited by the uh, lillian bayless uh shakespeare society for shakespeare's birthday they made the they asked me if i would do a toast this was on saturday nice because his birthday was you know the yes, 26th yes, yes, yes. so uh i led a toast to him and uh, but i uh that I, I lived in Montana and I had a ranch there with my brother for 28 years and it's been a big part of our life. I continue to spend quite a bit of time there and these two filmmakers that I had met uh, w had dedicated the last four years to filming uh, things in Yellowstone that I had never imagined any human would ever get to witness. And you, they, I, they came to me about doing the narration for Epic Yellowstone and uh, also to do kind of a, a little plug before and end. Right. But um, their work is what I would really recommend you all see with this four-part series. Um, it's such an unusual piece of geography, you know, the geysers mm -hmm. and all the thermal... Um, it's a very rare example on the earth, and it's the first national park in the world. You know, as Theodore Roosevelt saying, we need to protect this area, you know. And uh, the these husband and wife team from Bozeman, Montana, had got the Smithsonian to back them. And nobody makes a lot of money with documentaries, and they, they, they it's compared for the to love, how much the time lovers. they take to make. And I just think uh, you know you see things. Uh, amazing bobcat in the winter stuck in the high high uh, high high country with a lot of snow having to catch ducks on water and this they followed this bobcat three times in the course of a season and uh, actually you know how difficult it is for a cat to imagine getting wet <laughs> <laughs> not popular and watching this you know it's just the, but that's just yeah. one little bubble and the whole thing is filled with things like this that you can't imagine the world you get to witness uh, the animal life Bill unfortunately that's all we've got time for we've absolutely loved having you on Bill haven't we yeah. um, oh. we look forward to season three of um, to, we look forward to season three of of the center and also um, good luck with the rest of the play it's on screens until 
the 8th of June. You're on the stage, on, yeah. On stage till the 8th of June. Um, the 8th of June, you can get tickets until uh, to see uh, uh, the play at the Old Vic. And it's going to be broadcast in cinemas on this Tuesday, the 14th of May, as part of the National Live Theatre Week. So do not miss that. We'll be back at 4.45 with Bill Bailey. So do not go anywhere right now. Give it up one more time for the awesome Bill Pullman. Thank you. Thank you.